Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Education Show. Um, my name is David Mills and the topic for discussion today is the Sudbury model of education. Now we've already talked in some depth about the actual model in previous shows. Um, towards the end of August we had Bruce Smith um, who's, a, who's a staff member at Sudbury School and his insights were really, really interesting. So, but just to give you a very quick recap, um, since Bruce was actually quite impressed with my uh, description of a Sudbury school, for those of you who are not familiar, a Sudbury school is a, I just describe it as a natural learning environment in which children um, are mixed freely of all ages, age between five and 19, mixed freely and have um, the freedom to pursue their own interests, their own passions within the framework of a fully participatory democracy. So it's a very alternative approach to education. There's no prescribed curriculum. There are no formal classes as such. There's no external assessment. Um, and students don't leave with a traditional uh, set of qualifications. And speaking to Bruce, one of the things that he talked about was how beneficial it is for those who are skeptical about this model to talk to um, graduates of Sudbury School. And I'm delighted to have such a graduate on the show today. His name is Jesse Alford. He is a graduate from Alpine Valley School, which is in Denver, uh, Colorado. He graduated, uh, I think it was 2012, I'm going to pass over to him now to introduce himself and just give a little brief introduction to him and his background. Hello, Jesse, and welcome to the show. Thanks. It was actually a while earlier than 2012. Oh, okay. Oh, 2004. I, sorry. 2004. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 12 years ago. That's, that's what I had in yeah, my head. Time has a little bit of a slippery time. quality, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure it wasn't that <laughs> So Jesse, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, what are you doing now? Presently, I'm a software engineer for Pivotal. Uh, we make Cloud Foundry, which is a distributed platform as a service app scheduling container thing. It's a, I won't go into it too much. Uh, it's a very technical back-end software product. I'm presently the anchor on the release integration team. So I lead a team of engineers in putting all the components together and getting them shipped out. Uh, and I've been doing this for about three years. Uh, before that, I meandered through some tech support, some printer repair, brief stint in construction. Um, so I, I've done a number of things, but software is the place where I've really become the happiest. Fantastic. So going back to your education as a child, when did you actually join Alpine Valley? Did you have any prior education to that in any other learning environments? Yeah, so I showed up at AVS uh, when I was 11 or 12, and uh, prior to that, I'd been in a Montessori school, and Montessori is already this fairly gentle, free, child-emphasizing way of doing education, but even that was uh, creating a lot of strain in my family, because starting around uh, grade four or five, they, or even earlier, so starting around grade three and then intensifying in the latter grades, uh, the teachers started to have a fairly strong expectation that I would do homework and that it would be my mother's responsibility to make sure that I did the homework that they sent home with me since they couldn't, you know, I'd come in and it wasn't done and there's not a lot they could do about it. Yeah. And uh, it's really hard to make me do anything, it turns out. Uh, and my mother and I were there was a lot of strain in our relationship. We had a lot of fights and the homework sometimes got done and sometimes it didn't, but we were all suffering. So much credit to my mother. She said, I'm not going to let you ruin my relationship with my son. She started looking for alternatives and she found Alpine Valley School where we, you know, not only is there no homework, but there's no curriculum. There's a lot of freedom to just be and figure yourself out and learn how to be a human. Um, so I got to go do that starting around age 11 or 12. And I, I kind of wish that I had started at, at Alpine Valley School earlier, that we hadn't had to get to that point of crisis to realize that it was an option because there are subjects that I didn't come back to 
in my youth that I had to like rediscover as an adult because I had suffered at their hands so much. Like I had sat there staring out the window doing multiplication tables when everyone else was at recess, like enough times that I just had no interest in going back to that when I was put in charge of my own education. And you know, it didn't hurt me too much, but I kind of regret it because I came back to those things later and enjoyed them when I was able to arrive at them on my own. Yeah. So Jesse, what did you spend most of your time doing while you're actually at Alpine Valley? Because you've got freedom to choose what you do with pretty much every moment of every day, other than um, when you're required to serve on the judicial committee and contribute to the democratic yeah. aspects of the school. I'm, I'm glad that you started with that holdout of the administrative time, because I was going to do exactly the same thing. Okay. So like, well, let's set aside the administrative time for a second, because we we should talk about that separately. Yes. Um, okay. So not, you know, we're not in judicial committee or school meeting or doing chores or yeah. at home. Uh, I sat on couches a lot. Um, we I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. I played a lot of Magic: The Gathering, which is a collectible card game. Okay. Uh, Halo. Uh, we the the first Halo game was out when I was in school, and we set up a local LAN system so that because there was no Xbox Live, you couldn't. This online gaming thing wasn't a reality yet. Yeah. Uh, so we had a gaming room set up with multiple Xboxes, and we would get big 16-player games going with like all ages. Um, spent a lot of time doing those things, um, and I also I did end up at one class there. I was uh, in a writing class. I pr- I was always interested in writing, but I honestly principally joined because a girl I was interested in uh, <laughs> was in the writing class, and we yeah. would write just pieces, whatever, poems, prose, uh, about once a week, and then read them to each other and, and provide commentary and feedback. Uh, that was it, though. I think, I mean, I, I tried a couple of other classes briefly, um, but principally, I spent my time reading, messing with computers, uh, playing video games, and playing Dungeons & Dragons. Oh, and then the Asteroid game, which was a, a game we made up Yes, uh, played in the sandbox that had a bunch of kids um, building little civilizations and telling a story about them. Great stuff. So <laughs> and tag, we played a lot of tag. <laughs> <laughs> so when you reflect back on those experiences, how do you? In fact, let's talk a little bit about the administrative side of being in a Sudbury school. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. How did? I'm, I'm especially intrigued to know your answer. How did you respond to having to do chores? Was this something that you actively fought against or was it something that you accepted as part of your education? Well, so the chore system in particular is, first of all, since everything is done in uh, this democratic governance model, if I have a problem with the chore system, yeah. it is well, like, it is achievable. It is within the grasp of any student to change that system. Okay. Uh, it's okay. just a matter of get, getting the votes and, like, figuring out what would be better and doing it. Um, and a couple times we wanted to say, let's just spend the money, but then you have to find the money in the budget to have someone come in and do cleaning, for example. Yeah. So it, it was a policy issue <laughs> that we did chores. Okay. So that's a lot easier to swallow than someone saying you have to do chores. It's part of your education. It's good for you. It builds character or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, with you. So the other way that I dealt with it is that, uh, even if we couldn't spend the money out of the budget, generally there was another way to spend the money, which was you could hire someone else to do your chore. Uh, because it's not part of your education, it's just something that we all need to get done to make sure everything is pick up, picked up and vacuumed and bleached and dusted and whatnot. Yeah. The only important thing is that it gets done, not that you do it because it's a moral responsibility. So there was a, a pretty good secondary market in people who did each other's chores. Uh, and it was only a couple times a week. It wasn't every day. And the chores only took like half an hour to do generally. Um, so a lot of time I just do them. Uh, sometimes I would not do them and have to pay a fine. <laughs> but that was unfortunate. And there's a whole judicial process there. Okay. Um, usually we try to avoid that because it's preferable. Someone for less than the cost of the fine will, will do the chore. And then it actually gets done too. Yeah. So everyone prefers that. Um, and sometimes I actually I did cho- additional chores for, for money too. Uh, there were a number of little like 
thing because kids sit around, they need money for things. They can sell each other snacks or do chores for one another and that kind of thing. You get a little economy going. Um, not a, a big deal. Uh, it was fine. It was a system I had access to. It had reasonable, it wasn't um, a moral imposition. It was just a practical thing that we yeah. had to figure out together. And we had a bunch of ways of doing it that worked well for everyone. Great. Um, and tell us a little bit about um, the school meeting or, or judicial committee. Did you have uh, much involvement with either of those? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of our rituals upon... Uh, upon the graduation of a student from Alpine Valley is to go through their case history uh, from the judicial committee. Because um, wow. we, we just log cases and rule violations and convictions and sentences in, I don't know how they do it now, we had a binder then. Sure. And there are students who have 50 pages and you can't go through the whole thing because they've had a very active engagement with the legal system during their time <laughs> at school. Um, and there are students who have two because twice over the time they were in the school, they forgot to turn the oven off. Uh, and someone had to turn it off for them and write them up for, and, you know, they had to get recertified on the oven or whatever. Sure. Um, I, I was in, I wasn't at either of those extremes. I, I had a, a fairly, you know, I had many contacts with the judicial system, but that's normal. Um, one of the great things about JC judicial committee is that because students can routinely write each other up and be written up and be on the committee that does because it's a peer committee you have a you know a younger a middle-aged an older student plus the judicial clerk and the staff member sitting on committee hearing cases reviewing evidence and deciding whether to give charge or to lay charges and if uh, the person pleads guilty to issue a sentence Again, because you have a participation in both the execution of these laws and at the school meeting level, the ability to change them, yeah. there's a feeling of like justice to the whole thing. So, you know, I had a couple sentences that I didn't agree with and that I was very upset about. And I had a couple of cases that uh, I was on the judicial committee for that I thought, you know, were... Um, trivial or like, yes, they broke the law, but the law is wrong. So, you know, these are little things that we had to figure out how we needed to deal with them. But on the whole, it does radically redefine your relationship to authority to be a participant in that system of authority. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, got, I, you know, got banned from microwaving popcorn and couldn't go outside for two hours. And I had all these little sentences of, uh, in response to things that I had done that had negatively impacted other people. But when we all sorted it out, that felt mostly fair to most people most of the time. Right. Occasionally though, um, you, there would be something where uh, I would get charged and have to say, I didn't, that's either not an appropriate reading of the law or I factually didn't do that. And then it would go to trial, which is like a second sort of an appeal process where you have, uh, a more formal presentation of evidence and arguments than the judicial committee, which has the power to investigate. A trial is more like a system where the jury just listens and people are responsible for presenting their own cases. Yeah. Um, so it brings another layer of formality on it. And trials were great fun, and I won them a lot. Maybe more than I technically should have, but that's okay too, because it, it took this thing of being in trouble into sort of a high-stakes communication game. And high stakes, like we're talking about having to admit that I was wrong and accept some inconvenient sentence that like affects my life for less than a week, probably. Yeah. So the stakes feel a lot higher than they actually are. Though, you know, there are students who have more serious trials because they've done more serious things and are facing suspension, um, sometimes indefinite suspension, where they're obliged to ask for permission before they're allowed to come back. So it has a serious tone to it, but I, I tended not to be connected to those incidents. <laughs> From what you're saying to me, it's just so clear that you've got such, you've had such a great insight into, but it's almost like a mini version of the American political process within your school environment. Do you in feel some ways it's, yeah, in some ways it's a mini version of like an idealized version of the process okay. because it is a more direct democracy like we we elect people to office but we don't elect representatives yeah for instance and so this is a more direct sensation of power 
Um, and the 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 profit that's available from engaging in the system is not this huge dominant thing where it like the fastest way to be powerful in school is to get involved in politics. That's not it at all. The fastest way to be powerful in school is to be well liked and coordinate well with other people and, you know, be involved in activities that everyone likes. Yeah. So uh, if anything, it was like an idealistic version of American politics, okay. the way okay. that people would like it to be. And so we come, I, I've talked with a lot of students uh, or alumni of this thing who have come out and looked at real politics and said, well, this is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is insanely bad um, because the scale of the system is so different. Yeah. But yeah, like, like it definitely, we, we knew Robert's rules of order, right? We were all used to not only participating in committee reading uh, meetings that had a chair and like someone has the floor and then yeah. there's a process for proposing and seconding a motion or, um, calling for a vote and calling for a second vote, tabling a motion indefinitely, all these procedural aspects of actual meetings that our representatives participate in, in the American system, I think we are more prepared for. I've yet to hear of a Sudbury graduate saying, you know what I want? I want to be a politician so that I can be in meetings like I was in in school. Uh, but I think that would be the closer parallel. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, one thing that I know viewers are going to be especially keen to hear is the qualifications or certificate situation. Um, so you you graduated from Alpine Valley. You don't end up with any kind of formal qualifications, do you, to take into the workplace or to go to college? And, and, and indeed, did you actually make the choice to go to college after you graduated? Or what, what route did you take to get you to where you are now? Many Sudbury students do go to college. They generally uh, have no trouble getting in. Uh, I didn't. I looked at college, and I continue to look at college and see something that really doesn't make sense for what I want. For me, it looks like just a, a tremendous trap um, of sort of debt and conformity. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't go. Okay. I, I got a job in the tech industry doing tech support, and then sort of wove my way through doing uh, office equipment repair, fixing scanners and photoelectric copy equipment, um, and doing parts identification and technical support for scientific equipment for Agilent Technologies. And then I found my way into the software testing community uh, because they the, the context-driven school of the software community has a strong emphasis on autodidacticism, self-education generally, and the learning process that we engage in as we test software, looking for problems and possible improvements to it. And this was really well suited to what I was able to do. There's also this uh, bug advocacy portion of it, where when you find something that might be a problem, you have to see it from someone else's perspective and describe to someone who has the power to do something about it, why it's a problem and why they should care. And all of these things came very naturally to me uh, and is, are things that I was able to tie back to experiences I'd had gathering groups to do activities or playing Dungeons and Dragons or just figuring out why something was going weird with our Halo game or, or just being, right? Like just having a normal yeah. life. Um, I, and so I, I don't have a lot of certifications. I, what I ended up with was community acclaim in the software testing field. I was able to be publicly smart about testing. I, you know, on Twitter and in forums and at conferences uh, to the point that I had endorsements from other people who were well respected and I was able to, people were able to say, hey, you should take these courses. So I did take some um, BBST, black box software testing courses from the Association for Software Testing and I have certificates of completion for those but I, I don't, no one has ever asked to see them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I once took a fairly substantial financial risk to spend a week at uh, Jerry Weinberg, who's sort of a, uh, a slightly famous person in the software industry. He put on a week-long problem-solving leadership workshop. And I, you can't get like student loans for professional workshops, so I put it on credit cards. And I wasn't in the software industry yet, so there's this crazy risk. 
but it really paid off when I had an interview uh, here at Pivotal where I work now the director of engineering had also been a graduate of that course not the same year but she had done it before and she recognized what realizing that I needed to go there and taking a risk to put myself there meant about me and she was very impressed so it ended up being about experiences and connections and personal acclaim uh, not at all about certificates. I also, I um, before I went to Alpine Valley School, I, I earned a black be- or no, a red belt in Taekwondo. But again, oh. no one has ever asked to see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the extent of my certifications, though. I, I have some printer repair certifications too. No one cares. No. <laughs> it's more about who you are as a person. Is is what's got you to where you are. Yeah. Well, and software is a field where there are lots of people who have gotten in without this credentialism holding them back. So it's a little bit less uncommon or surprising here than it has been in some other professional environments that I've been in where people are surprised that I am able to get a mechanical repair job without a technical uh, school background or whatever. But a lot of those stories focus on, you know, whiz kids who have played with computers their whole life and then, uh, drop out of college to join a tech company. It wasn't like that for me. I learned to program on the job here after having, because we do pair programming, um, so where you're working directly with another person and you're working on the same code. Um, This is a great way to learn. And honestly, from I, I work with a lot of people who have computer science degrees and the what they got out of being here has been more valuable to them than their entire computer education right. all kinds of things that are required in the uh, in the actual world of software engineering like continuous integration unit testing uh, design patterns in different programming languages are basically not taught in college so they arrive with all this arcane knowledge they can't use so I didn't have that much you might you know have thought that I would start far behind people not as far as you'd think no. <laughs> great stuff um, I'm just conscious we're, we've got five minutes left. So one thing I want you to talk about a bit more is um, when, you, when you look back on your Sudbury education, uh, we had a brief chat before we, we started the live broadcast, and you said for you it's more a case of what didn't happen that was important in terms of preparing you for adult life than what you actually benefited from. Would you elaborate on that a bit for us? Yeah, so when I look back, people ask a lot, like, what do you think you got out of this education, especially after we've had this conversation about how, like, well, you know, I basically did whatever I wanted, I played games with my friends, I got used to dealing with kids that were younger than me and older than me, all as peers, Uh, you know, when 19-year-olds and 5-year-olds hang out, it's uh, a lot easier for the 19-year-olds not to take themselves so deadly seriously, like teenagers uh, often do. I mean, they still do. You can't, you can't stop teenagers. Um, but the thing that really, I have come to believe that it was more important what didn't happen to me, as you were saying, because I feel that as before I went to Alpine Valley School, I already was beginning to curdle. Um, like, my teachers was that they were oppressors. And... I had the sort of feelings that oppressed people have towards oppressors. I hated them. Uh, And I, you know, I treated them civilly because my parents, you know, taught me civility, but I really hated them in a way that scares me a little bit to look back on as an adult because I can, I can recognize darkness. And I think that would have become a lot more of me if I had had to continue to go through a system where I had to slowly give up bits of myself and my autonomy and my, Uh, ability to focus and follow energy that or to follow things that are energetic for me things that draw my interest if I was continuously forced to chop off that part of myself you know I I don't like to think too much about how that would have affected me Uh, I see a lot of adults um, who have been very affected by that who I I see in their uh, early work uh, situations especially they tolerate things that they shouldn't because they have internalized this system of giving up and resenting things as like their coping mechanism for life and that's what they learned in school was a combination of how to give up and hate and I didn't really learn how to give up and uh, I didn't really learn how to keep that hate you know alive and deep <laughs> um, and I'm very grateful for that because it, it scares me to think of what that sort of 
mechanism for coping with ho- hopelessness looks like in an adult. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And one final question I had for you is um, whenever I mean, I'm quite a big proponent of the Sudbury school model, having spent some time at, at three Sudbury schools. Um, and but one objection I get when I come back to the UK and say, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a whole raft of Sudbury schools is people say that wouldn't work for all students. It's only going to suit a certain type of individual. I'm just intrigued what your response is to that. Do you, do you agree with that point of view? I actually do. I, I think that it's not going to work for everybody. Okay. Uh, one of the great things about having a whole raft of Sudbury schools is that you would presumably still have other schools. And uh, if all schools were Sudbury schools, you would in a way be taking away a, f- a type of choice that students can have about what type of school they go to. Okay. Uh, I had friends who chose to return to the public school system after experiencing the Sudbury school system because they wanted things that a small Sudbury school didn't have, like a robust theater program or just like a big school with lots and lots of people. And, you know, maybe a Sudbury school could be that. Ours wasn't, but maybe one uh, could be. I know there are some that are larger. Uh, I also think that there's been a fair amount of study done around, to me, the, the state of the field on uh, the study of education is that it's not clear that school actually matters that much. Uh, and like children are amazingly resilient and durable creatures. So they get through the school that we do to them and yeah. gr- manage to be great people anyway. Um, but uh, there are a lot of factors that play into adult attainment that have little to do with school, like um, just uh, like home and family situation and the like educational and professional attainment of their parents. And I don't, I think these factors may be dominant. And when those factors are dominant for someone to be at a Sudbury school, the best we can say is that it wouldn't torture them, which, you know, is a pretty good thing to say. But may, there are other school systems that wouldn't torture them either, probably, and that may provide some support that they wouldn't naturally get. That said, I think that a lot of people picture troubled teens or difficult youths and say, oh, that wouldn't work for someone with disability or someone from a poor socioeconomic background. I think they might be surprised. Uh, I think the people they're thinking it might not work for are actually not necessarily the ones that I think it might not work for. We've seen a lot of people end up at Sudbury schools just as a reality in our system where people who don't fit well in other schools end up at at a Sudbury school like I did, right? My, well, I, I didn't fit well with the homework system. We have people who had behavioral problems. Sometimes the judicial committee is all that takes is they get into a place where they're not facing arbitrary authority and they're instead being held to account by a community of their peers and it transforms their relationship with authority. So I I think people should be careful about who they assume won't do well in a Sudbury school and give people a year or two to try it. You know, a year or two of education doesn't matter that much in the scheme of like if you're going to be really successful because of your fantastic intelligence and ability to study you can do it without having seventh and eighth grade for instance like I I don't I think school is not as risky a proposition as a lot of parents feel like they have this fear that they're going to screw it up that they're going to break their child's future by sending them to a weird school for a, a couple of years and like then they wait because kids get to uh, Sudbury schools and they start to decompress and sort of spread out into the freedom. And sometimes they just sit on the couch for a year and the parents are tearing their hair out because they can't believe that this will ever be okay. It is. It's fine. And that kid who sits on the couch for a year is going to get bored of that and is going to have to decide to do something else. But first, they're going to have to figure out how they work. And I think that's the big thing that even kids we think who you know might not work that well, we picture troubled people Alpine Valley School gives troubled people a chance to sort of figure themselves out. Uh, And Sudbury schools generally, not just Alpine Valley, right? And I I think that's something that people don't consider. They think of school as sort of pressing knowledge into students. And I I take a a radical constructivism approach that people can only educate themselves. And so uh, giving people an environment where they are safe and free and respected works for a surprising number of people. Awesome. There you go. I think we'll stop there. I, you've 
you've said everything that needs to be said unless there's anything else which you feel that's kind of in your your heart you're burning to share that you feel needs to be a message that we need to hear about Sudbury education does anything else come to mind I'll end on the absolute courage it asks for in parents uh, and and families you end up sending your kid to this crazy school where they can be happy instead of being miserable and be free instead of being oppressed and then you have to deal with the judgment as you know as a parent of yeah. your parents and your your surrounding family, the kids' aunts and uncles, you ha at family gatherings, people are asking them how their grades are, and they're like, "I don't have grades." We have a a rule, a, a trick that we teach each other in Sudbury schools, where when someone asks you what grade you're in, you take your age and subtract five, and that's your grade because we we just don't know, and everyone is always asking. <laughs> um, so, like, it takes. A, a great deal of courage and commitment to be, do something so weird and so dangerous feeling. And it seems like you might wreck a child and it's the thing you care most about in the world. And everyone's skeptical that you're doing the right thing. Um, it's hard. And I, uh, that, that point in my story where my mother said, I'm not doing this, this is not okay is extraordinarily important. And I, I think that it is underappreciated how much we're asking for in terms of courage from parents when we ask them to consider these alternative models in a society that increasingly believes that children should really be age-batched, factory-processed, and st tested in a standardized way. Yeah. Great. Jesse, thank you so much for your time. It really is appreciated. Uh, wonderful to hear your insights on how your Sudbury education has set you up for adult life. Um, those of you who have watched, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited about some of the people we've got coming on on future shows. I've just lined up today a 12-year-old girl who's got some amazing dreams to improving the world. I'm very excited to get her on to launch the Kids Speak uh, platform, which is uh, one of my next initiatives. Uh, but that's all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Jesse. Thank you again. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. It was a great okay. pleasure. Goodbye, everybody, and see you on the next education show. Thank you very much.